In our work when we are still alone, when it feels all of our allies and our help are not around us. That is the situation Paul finds himself in in the beginning of our passage. Probably about three weeks ago or so now, we were, uh, before we were looking at a passage where Paul had to part ways from uh, Silas and Timothy, not finding any dispute because they're being chased around yet again, persecuted, chased across all of Greece. And so now Paul was in Athens last week and he continues to move on. And now he will be in Corinth, the Greek city, where he'll finally meet up with his friends again, but still battling that question of how am I to continue See, Corinth uh, was a capital city of the region. Corinth was located on an isthmus, you know, a small strip of land with water on either side. And it was a place with a lot of big parties and loose morals. And sounds probably not too dissimilar from Madison, right? It was a place very much like our city here. And he establishes a church, as we will see. And it's a church that continues to give him a lot of problems. If you read first. In 2 Corinthians, is to the believers he meets here. And the church had a lot of dysfunction, a lot of problems. But his ministry here still begins with some problems. Problems of rejection. Problems of persecution that lay ahead for Paul as he arrives in Corinth. So follow along with me here in the words on the screen. Uh, Acts chapter 18. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. Because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word testifying to Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Eustace, a worshiper of God. And his house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you or harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. And refused to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. It's the word of the Lord. Yeah, many years ago, Emma and I, my wife, went to see a, a Milwaukee Brewers game. Only it, it wasn't really exactly a Milwaukee Brewers game, as they were not hosting it. They were visiting uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates. We were both going to school not far from Pittsburgh, about an hour away, so we drove down to PNC Park, Pittsburgh, to watch the um, Brewers arrive in town and play the Pirates. We bought our, our tickets pretty close to the game, so we were pretty high up, pretty high up in the bleachers, surrounded by a bunch of overserved Yinzers cheering on their native Pirates. Now, growing up in Milwaukee, I'd been to many Brewers games to cheer on my home team, surrounded by fellow Milwaukeeans. But this was my first time actually being surrounded by opposing fans, not being in my own city with my people. And the Brewers then went on to beat the Pirates, which was actually uncomfortable for me because I didn't know when to cheer or how to. Like, any time we hit a home run, I was like... Yeah, just really quiet so as not to invoke the violent, loud hate of the local fans. So I found it easier just to stay silent. Now, 
Paul is not arriving in Corinth to cheer on his Tarsus thunder, uh, but he's here to spread news of his Savior. The Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Now, perhaps you're getting tired of this in our series in Acts, of the amount of times, oh, yay, another time he's getting beaten. Oh, another time he's being chased around. It's fallen, this kind of cyclical nature. Yeah, uh, before this passage, he's been, had this kind of encounter with opponents six times now. He converts a lot of Jewish people, a lot of Greek people, but there's a contingent of Jewish people there that are mad at him, try to kill him, try to arrest him. It's happened six times, and now, yay, lucky number seven happens again. You can think by this time in his second journey, now seven times for cheering on the name of Jesus, you might understand, Paul, why don't you just kind of act like me at a pirate's game? Yay, Jesus, please don't let anyone find out. Maybe that's how you feel sometimes at school or at work or among your family. You know, it's weird enough to sometimes say, yeah, no, I can't meet up for brunch on Sunday. I've got church then. But what about times, not like that, but when you're actually surrounded by people who are speaking of Christians in unfavorable favorable ways? Those Christians are so hateful. Those Christians are so angry all the time. Those Christians are so backwards. What do you, what do you say then? Do you say anything? Do you just let those comments pass by? I, I, I sympathize. That can be hard. It can feel very easy just to be silent. It can be an easy temptation because how do you take those responses? It's hard enough to take objections and responses from one, one person. But what if uh, the objections of all five people surrounding you? Though, yes, I'm a trained pastor in the church, I doubt I uh, can take on five people's objections in once, like a debate, like some sort of John Wick of apologetics. No, I'm not that strong, right? But I want to offer to you not my words of encouragement here, rather the words of Christ that we encounter in this passage. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you or harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. See, throughout this passage, before and after this vision, we see confirmation of that promise, that because God is with us, we can go on speaking. So we must go on speaking then, because God has promised he is with us, both in our work in our ministry, as well as even in our civil life, that we can go on speaking, not be afraid of the harm that may come to us, because God has promised to be with us. That all of these areas are things that God can still work through and in, for there are many in this city who are his people. How does um, our work then fit into God's plan? So often we might feel like our own work and our lives, there's this sacred secular divide. We have this time here and that everything we do from Monday to Friday is just completely worldly and how can it be, how can God use that for his glory? We see in the beginning that Paul arrives in Corinth and he immediately makes some friends. Great. It's before he even though gets to the synagogue where he usually would begin his work. Before we hear him talking in the synagogue, he meets Aquila and Priscilla who are fellow tent makers, but I think there's also some maybe good evidence that they're fellow Christians, too. They're originally from Rome, but sent out of Rome by a decree from Roman uh, Emperor Claudius. Now, historians know about this decree from Claudius. It was a decree that sent out all Jews who were instigating riots or uh, at the instigation of Crestus. Oh, Crestus, right? Who's Crestus? Well, some people think it's probably actually just a Greek mis, you know, a misunderstanding of the Greek name of Jesus Christ, Christos. They didn't know, the Romans and the Greeks didn't know what, who Christos was, but they knew what Crestus meant, you know, worthy or attainable, something like that. And so they kept hearing all these Jewish people getting in fights as the gospel has gone out ahead of Paul in some areas, and there are Jewish people fighting in Rome over this Christ name, this Christos name, Christus name. And so um, um, Priscilla and Aquila are sent out away from there and they arrive and meet Paul here. But what they connect with here is not mostly their faith, but it's actually their work. They're connected on their work. It seems to almost be their first connection. Now, Paul, 
Yes, was a missionary. He was a, trained to be a rabbi, but he needed a side job. And his side job it was important because rabbis weren't allowed to take a lot of money for teaching on the Torah. So he had a job of tent making, literally making the canvas for tents out of spinning goat hair together. You know, it's a small detail there. Of, oh, cool, they're tent makers. But why is this important? Because it is in this common space of work that he's able to meet with other Christians, connect with others. And these are Christians who are incredibly influential in the early church. Priscilla and Aquila will get shout-outs from Paul in Romans and 1 Corinthians and 2 Timothy. He commends them to all these churches, a church in Rome, Corinth, and Ephesus. They would become well-loved, well-respected people in the church. They're good co-laborers with Paul in the harvest, but also they're co-workers too. They share the same trade, the same business. And I think, again, it seems like such a small little, hey, that's a cool detail about Paul. He makes tents, you know. Uh, he could be a cool guy working at REI or something. But what, is, what it shows is what actually God cares about in your work life. That God can still be use your skills for his glory. And that's what God uses in Paul at this time. Not in this very moment, he's not using his, his skills interpreting scripture and evangelism. But he's working in Paul to build the church by simply asking, hey, wh what knife do you have there? What are you using that for? Oh, that's a nice loom. Where'd you get that? That's a really good you know, way of spinning thread. How are you doing that? And just talking about their trade. And that's the connection that it begins. And I think what this is to commend for us is that God is indeed with you in your work. He w is with you in your work life. And that you, in your work, by doing well in your work, can act as glorifying God. The reformer Martin Luther has said that the Christian shoemaker does his Christian duty not by putting little crosses in the shoes, but by making good shoes. Because God is interested in good craftsmanship. He's not saying that God is a sneakerhead and he really loves good shoes, but in some ways, yeah. God loves the beauty of a well-crafted thing. God is pleased by our good work. Why? Because God himself is a creator. He is a craftsman. He is someone who relates, who loves. He is the source of knowledge. He is the source of order. So when we practice that in our work lives, for that is what our work often is, it's beautiful and it's pleasurable for God. And um, in an old film, uh, Chariots of Fire, which tells the story of these two Olympic runners, one is a Jewish man and another um, a Christian man from Scotland. Uh, this uh, man, Eric Little, who's from Scotland, is, is talking about what, how he believes his ability to run in the Olympics is, what it has to do with God? How can it be a sanctifying thing? He says, I believe that God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. That God is interested in our good abilities and he's interested in our good work. It's a way we can glorify him because he gave us that ability to do it and we can connect with other believers through that and we can also witness to others through it and just by being good workers. Yes, God is interested in good customer service. God is interested in educated and training people knowledge. Why? Because he's the source of all knowledge. And he is the one who teaches us. So when you act through that and, and work through that, you are glorifying God. Yes, even if your job is coding and computer engineering, it is so beautiful and glorifying to God because it is reflective of creative order, of rules and order that God has put in the universe. And you're doing that even at this small digital level. It is a way of glorifying God, and we work well because it is a way we can praise God in that. And so, in your work life with others around you, if, if you are setting that example and living that way, it's a way to just to simply say, Hi, I do this because of my Savior, because of my God, because, yes, even though I am broken, and I don't always do things well, I don't craft things perfectly, I'm pointing to someone who is perfect, my Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for me so that I will be perfect one day in all glory. There is a way that as we grow in holiness that we can also experience the redemption even of our work. Not a full redemption that we will see in this life, but I believe in the new heavens and new earth we'll be doing a form of work, form of maybe tent making, maybe crafting. 
because it is glorifying to God. He is interested in it. He cares for us in it, and he is with us in it. And so God is also not only with you in your work life, but he's with you in your life of of ministry, in your life of growth. Now, Paul probably dearly needs this reminder, because as Paul, as Silas and Timothy arrive from Macedonia, Macedonia, Paul's already, it says, occupied in the word. He's deep in the word. He's surrounded by the word. He is almost like assailed by it. He can't get out. He is deep in this work, teaching the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And what does he get from that? What's the response he gets? More rejection. Big surprise, right? And they reposed and reviled him. He shook off his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads, I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. We've seen this response before. We saw it in Acts 13. uh, When they left the town and had to shake off the dust from their feet, We see that same response in the Gospels when Jesus sends his disciples out. It is an action of when you are rejected by a town, of to say, I'm shaking off the rejection from you and moving on. It's a way of not letting that rejection hang on you completely. And why is that important? It sounds almost naive, like, no, they really have, like, mocked you and ridiculed you. Why why would you have the audacity to shake that off? Because it's the realization that they are not rejecting you. As a person, they might think they are and might feel like that. I think it often does feel like that. But ultimately, what they are rejecting is the gospel of Christ. They've rejected God. And what Paul is doing here is to say, I am am here not to set up the St. Paul church. I'm not here to be the one person who changes hearts. I am not a heart surgeon, spiritually speaking, to change people's minds. My duty here is to proclaim the name of Christ, to speak his message And people, by God's will, will reject it or accept it. And those who accept it accept God's blessings, and when those reject it, they invite God's curses. He's saying it's not ultimately up to me. It's not all on me. But it's God who does the work. It's God who does the calling. It's God who knows who his people are. There are many in this city who are my people, Jesus says to him. He knows who his people are. And so that also means Paul's not to have a wooden view of who he goes to first or second or last. He's not saying here that he'll never speak to Jews again about Jesus. He will continue to do that work. He's not turning completely from the entire uh, religious ethnic group of the Jews. But he is saying here in this city of Corinth, he was preached to the Jewish people. Some have believed, others have not. And he's going to go on to the Greeks, which is a harder harder place to go because the Jews have an understanding of who God is. They have an understanding of what their covenant God is. We have an understanding of of what it means to be a Messiah. Going to the Greeks is going to be a lot harder, isn't it? But he's able to say, if God is really the one who's with me, if God is the one doing the work here, then if he's changing the direction, he'll be with me even then. That God it doesn't call us to only one target of ministry, only one approach of ministry, but he will help me in every phase. And so he does see great success of Titus Eustace coming to faith, of Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, all these people who he is using to build the church, people with great means of, of houses that the believers can meet in and, and be together in. It's a great way that the church begins here in Corinth. And it shows that God is with him even as he's being rejected. And Paul apparently, I think, needs to remember this. Because he hears these words from Jesus. And I I think it's safe to conclude that for some reason or another, he was fearful of continuing to speak. Again, six times already he's been beaten or arrested. And he's experiencing rejection again. He probably knows what's coming next. That at some point he's getting arrested. And yet he needs these words, do not stop speaking. Because he feels pretty alone. He needs the reminder that God is with him. That there are people in this city who are his. So he probably doesn't feel very fruitful in his ministry. And that can be really hard in the first place when we feel alone, and then secondly, when we feel like what we're doing isn't making a difference. Have you felt like that, maybe even now, that what you do is not making a difference? You know, maybe it's not like you're doing full-time ministry like Paul, but you're hoping for some sort of growth in your life, hope for some sort of step to get to this next 
part of your life, of your spiritual growth, of your, uh, of your own life and relationships, and nothing is changing, and it's just completely empty and fruitless, it feels. Feeling like you're trying to, you know, harvest fruits, and yet you're getting no water there. Trying to find it, trying to raise a crop, and every single point there seems to be a roadblock, a challenge, or an adversity. It can be really difficult when you feel like nothing is changing in my spiritual growth. Nothing is changing for what's coming next to me. I'm you know, hoping to maybe even grow a family, find a spouse, have a child, and it's still not happening. And you're wondering, God, where are you in this? Are you here? Are you with me? You've promised you would be. Where are you? It's a very lonely and difficult time when you speak that. But remember this promise that God is with you. And what fruitfulness means, it may not happen at your time or the way you see it or the way you expect it, but there are times you have to change direction. And when that happens, it's hard to know. And that might happen in ministry in the same way as it does at the personal level. of you pouring into a hope, pouring into someone else, giving your hopes and your efforts into a dream or giving your hopes and your efforts into someone else, hoping that they will grow and nothing is happening. There seems to be no fruit. Remember this second part of this promise. I am with you for I have many in the city who are my people. That not only are you not alone because God is with you, but you are part of the church body. That you belong to the church and you are with them. And Paul realizes, as, as years later, he writes back to this church and realizes he didn't affect all this change himself. He says in verse Corinthians 3, verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the growth. That all the growth actually came from God, not from his work. Because God promotes the growth. And he'll use other people for those ends. So as you feel fruitless in things, waiting for answers, waiting for change, realize it might take more time than you're expecting, but he also might be using more people than you're expecting, too, in your life. There is a faith here at work that is greater than just you yourself. So that when you hear, I am with you, God is not simply just saying you as an individual, but I am with you and my people, and I know my people. Be united and one with my people and see the growth that I'm working among all of you. And to see our ministry and our growth bigger than just ourselves. And this last one is, I think, a little harder. Uh, to see and to understand, a little actually harder to feel encouraged by. This is maybe one of the least encouraging parts of the passage of the civil component, the political component of this passage. Because we've got uh, political figures. We've got Claudius. We've got Gallio. And God still works through them, though they are not believers, and though they do things that are actually pretty messed up and pretty unjust. It's God still works through them. God is still with his people, even through corrupt, wicked, unjust people like Claudius, sending all the Jews out of Rome. This is, like, it's so frustratingly tragic that this, is, of course, is not the first time Jews are going to be expelled from European cities. It's going to happen a lot more times in the next 2,000 years. And this happens that people who fear the Lord and know him and love him, and, and many Jews who fear the Lord and love Jesus, are being sent out of Rome. Is this a good thing? No. Is God able to work good out of it? Yes. Aquila and Priscilla are cast out of Rome, become refugees, become immigrants here in Corinth, and through that meet Paul, working with Paul. And God uses Aquila and Priscilla to be great, important people in the church. That even something like this decree that oppresses God's people, Christians and Jews... People, the church is still growing. It's still a way that God works. Now look at Gallio. He's a little bit of a mixed bag here, it feels like, because you first read Gallio refusing to judge and releasing Paul. Like, wow, Gallio must be on Paul's side. This is great. Is he a Christian? No, he's not. For he speaks on his behalf, but he also refrains from doing the right thing later. For Paul was about to speak, and Gallo just stops Paul from speaking and says, You know, if this were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would, rele I would reason, have reason to accept your complaint. 
But since it's a matter of questions and words and names about your law, see to it yourselves. See, the Jews had one main accusation against Paul. You know, it ever, it's ever, cease, it, it ever changes city to city. And this time, their, um, their accusation is because, well, Judaism and many of the religions had protection in Rome. They were a uh, illicit religion, a legal religion, one you could worship freely under Roman law. But Christianity is new right now. And so they're trying to say to Gallio, these, this, these Christians are different from us. They want us to do things that are contrary to our system of belief, so treat them differently. They are an illicit religion, an illegal religion. Get rid of these Christians. They are not like us. They're just this weird culty fringe group. Don't connect us. Paul's just about to defend himself as he has many times defending that, no, all the things about Christianity come from the Bible, come from the Jewish scriptures. So how can you say we're different? But he doesn't get to that because all Gallio, Gallio hears is Christ this, Messiah that, you know, Psalm this, Isaiah that. And he's like, I don't know what any of that means. But it sounds like a whole bunch of Jewish stuff. So you guys figure it out. I'm not the arbiter here. I'm not getting involved. Great. That's really helpful. But I, I think we start to see he's not this great political wise figure. He's more of a Ron Swanson who just wants to avoid any work at all possible. Because then after that, Sosthenes gets seized, this ruler of the synagogue, and gets beaten right in front of him. And he doesn't care. He says pays no attention. He pretty much see, sees it, chooses not to intervene, turns a blind eye, and lets this happen. We don't know quite who Sosthenes is, not much about him. He could have been a Jewish convert to Christianity, and the Jews are beating him up. He could be a Jewish man that the Greeks are beating up. We don't know, but it is this violence of hate that is happening. And Gallio is just happy not to get Rome involved at all, just to keep his hands clean of any of this. Is God still with his people in a time like that? It's hard, because it's like I said, that double-sided coin, the Christians are protected by this ruling. But if we understand Sosthenes, this ruler of the synagogue, perhaps that filled in after Crispus, or another synagogue that, that converted, we're not sure. But there's still other injustice happening. This is not just mere justice that's happening through Gallio. Is God still with us? Even when the cynical and lazy politicians refuse to do their duty? It can feel lonely and frightening and difficult. And honestly, as I, I think about modern American politics, I feel alone myself too in the current American political climate. Because both parties continuously frustrate me. And continuously, like Gallio, might on one day uh, do things that promote justice and promote things that God loves and defend things, and the very next day do things that God hates. Both parties are a victim of that. I think both parties make it really hard for me to support because neither really fulfill the call to love the orphan, the widow, the immigrant at our gates, to do what is right, what is pure, what is just. Both fail at that. And I feel like if you follow the news, you're riding highs and lows and roller coasters of that all the time. And what that leaves me with as our government continues to turn blind eyes from certain areas of injustice, just certain parts that their party would rather turn away from when evil is happening, it means that our hope is not that, you know, the American government is with us, but that God is with us, his church. That it's not that our country trusts in God, but that we, the church, does. That is what our faith is in. That God allies us to, we are allied by connection to his people. For there are many in this city that are his, God says. And so we must trust that truth. Trust that there are many that God will use and work through. That God will work through those in government who fear him and love him. Yes. And praise God for that. God will also work through people who oppose and reject him. People like Claudius, people like Gallio. That just because someone doesn't agree with everything we do, God can still work through things to their glory, like evil decrees like Claudius' decree of expulsion, and good things like Paul not being thrown into prison. We can still hope that God is still with us in spite of 
and through our government. So that should give us confidence. It should give us security and understanding that we don't need to stay silent. That true harm cannot really affect us. We put our trust in a Savior who's promised to be with us, a Savior who died for us and rose again from the dead, and has promised that by faith in his resurrection and his work for us, we will not taste death. That, yeah, the body they might destroy or kill, but God's truth still continues to abide, and we have hope of a new body and a new heavens and new earth. So what is really the fear anyway? So let us continue to speak of, of that good news and of that hope. Letting our mouths be open and not fearing what will happen. It was a scene in, in Disney's Lion King uh, that illustrates this, I think, of this young lion cub Simba who has run outside where he shouldn't be and is being chased by hyenas, backs into a dark cave with he and his friend Nala. Their back, their back is against the wall. And he musters up all the courage and strength he has in his stomach and lets out the mightiest roar he can. And it's nothing really more than a row. And it's nothing. It's pitiful. It's empty. It makes the hyenas laugh uncontrollably. And he musters up one more, opens his mouth, and a roar shakes the whole cave and stops them dead in their tracks. That's not his roar. It's not his voice. It's the roar of his father, King Mufasa, who throws himself upon the hyenas, thrashing them and pinning them to the ground and saying that they are not to harm or touch his son because he belongs to him. And it's his roar and his strength that does the work and defends him. In the same way as our God calls us to speak, he doesn't call us to speak with our pitiful meows, that we and our human folly think will really have great effects. But really, we hope and we pray that when we open our mouths, it is the roar of the Lion of Judah, Jesus, who speaks for us. It is the Lion of Judah who is our strength. And it's because of our faith in him that we are called sons of God. That the Father looks down on us and says no harm will come to him. That no destruction will happen to their soul for they will live again because of what Jesus has done. That is the God who's with us, a mighty, immortal, ever-living lion who speaks for us, the Lion of Judah, Jesus Christ. We are his, as by faith in him. So let us pray. Let us hear those words that promise where he has said, I am with you. Do not fear. Let's pray.